Now on this channel I tend to spend quite a lot of time talking about the more expensive cars on my driveway like Ionic 5 or the Tesla, just there. But now I'm going to talk about the Leaf, the Nissan Leaf. Oh no, this is like most Leaf owners' worst nightmare. The Nissan Leaf battery management algorithm uh, does need to be taken with a pinch of salt. Me replacing that has saved £81.60, that's how much it would have cost if Nissan had done it. Okay, good, that's on. Quality content on this channel, eh? Just a little leaf update, this one, which doesn't, makes a nice change, doesn't it? Okay, let's get in the car. It's incredibly dusty. Oh. So I'm fully aware I don't do enough videos about the leaf. Um, because actually the Leaf gets a lot of interest in my videos just because it's cheap, or relatively cheap anyway, for an electric car. A lot of people want to get something like a Leaf because most electric cars cost an absolute fortune and there are loads of second-hand Leafs and Zoes on the market. So quick little Leaf update for you then. We bought it on the 8th of April 2021 and if you want to see the video about buying it then um, click up there, or up there, I always can never remember which way to point. Click up there and you'll see how we bought it. We bought it at auction for about, what, 5,250 or something like that, but around that. So the first thing to mention is car wings. Now, what you've got on the Leaf, and it was probably quite innovative at the time, thinking about it, um, you've got an app. And back then it was called Car Wings. I'm not sure what it's called now. It might be Nissan Connect or something like that. But Car Wings is just an app so you can turn on things like the air conditioning on the car and check the battery percentage and all that. Monumentally slow on these old Leafs because it's only got, I think, like a 2G connection, I think. So it's extremely slow, but it's still good to have. And it's useful, useful in those cold winter months when you might want to turn on the heating or something like that before you get out of the car. So I wanted to get that enabled. And I tried registering myself on the 19th of April. Uh, so I bought it on the 8th of April, tried registering on car, for car wings 19th of April, and it didn't work. So many emails back and forth to Nissan, and they're very nice actually, a bit slow, but you know, very nice. Finally sorted it 17th of May 2022, so that took 11 months for them to be able to sort it. God knows what the issue was, because I tried using different usernames, tried using different email addresses, all this sort of stuff. They kept coming back and saying, could you try it now, could you try it now? It didn't work. All I can think is that the previous owner must have been registered, obviously, registered for car wings, and for whatever reason they couldn't unlink it on the on their old systems. So they must have done something in the background. God knows what they did, but anyway, it's, it's sorted now, so that's good. It does mean that I didn't have any kind of stats. I love my stats. I didn't have any stats for 11 months, which is a bit annoying. So the lost battery bar. Now, when you get a leaf, that's what you want to check. You want to check that it's got 12 bars of battery. So you can see up there, there's a little missing square, and that would be where the 12th bar is. So that's not there, so I've only got 11 bars. That is the battery state of health. The first chunk, so you've got 12, it's split into 12 chunks, and the first chunk is, um, will go after you get to 85% state of health. Now, I was planning like a whole series, well, a whole, not a whole series of videos, but certainly a long video just about this because James, who did the first service, the major service that we had, he, he checked it on something called Leaf Spy and he said, ah, oh, that's about to go to under 85%. After that, you lose a battery bar. You need to rapid charge it a couple of times. And I said, what? Really? Rapid charging? Because I thought rapid charging was bad for a battery. So at this point of the video, I was going to talk about battery health and how to improve the battery in your EV. But instead of me going on about a subject I don't really understand, let's talk to someone who does, Dr. Ewan McTurk. So I'm Dr. Ewan McTurk. I'm a consultant battery electrochemist from Plug Life Television on YouTube and Plug Life Consulting, which is my day job. The state of charge of my Leaf battery, I dropped a bar and I was told that rapid charging might help improve that. And in fact, I did do some rapid charging and it has improved the state of health. Um, but what's the reason for that? The Nissan Leaf battery management algorithm uh, does need to be taken with a pinch of salt. It's very susceptible to the charging power, charging speed, and the ambient temperature as well. And generally, the colder the weather is, or the colder the battery is, and the faster it's charged, the higher its state of health it reckons it is. Um, so actually, what we've seen with Nissan Leafs that have 3.3 kilowatt onboard chargers versus the ones that have 6.6 .6 is that a seemingly identical car 
apart from those, you know, the onboard chargers, is driven in the exact same manner and charged in the exact same way, the 3.3 kilowatt ones will consistently show a lower state of health than the 6.6 because they charge the battery slower and the algorithm thinks, okay, it's less healthy because of however that algorithm works. It's obviously overcompensating based on charge speed. And that's why, yeah, I mean, that's why when it comes to rapid charging, yeah, there's this, there's this technique that you can do that, um, yeah, if you, if you rapid charge it multiple times, you trick the BMS into thinking that the, the battery is, is healthier and it increases the state of health a bit, um, which to be honest is, is almost the EV equivalent of putting sawdust in the gearbox. It's, it's not actually improving the battery at all. It's just that the algorithm has been tricked a bit. A perfect example, actually, with my own Nissan Leaf that I, I got in 2017. It was three years old at the time. The battery was 92% state of health, it said. And then six months later, in a good sort of eight to 10,000 miles, the beast from the east hit. So we went from summer 2017 through to winter of 2018. And obviously, it had been rapid charged a bit along the way as well. But it was so brutally cold, it thought the battery was 102% state of health. So very much pinch of salt stuff this and that's okay. why your car having been rapid charged a bit thinks that it's gained a bit of capacity in reality it, it most likely hasn't electrochemically okay. it's, it's it wouldn't make sense so had i done the rapid charges before it hit the 85 percent, then actually i wouldn't have lost the bar but well i wouldn't have necessarily lost the bar but what you're saying is take it with a pinch of salt anyway yeah exactly so you know you, you wouldn't have lost that bar um, you cannot regain that bar now that you've lost it, even if you put it back up above 85%. Actually, that's a good point. The state of health bars are not in equal segments. They appear to be on the dashboard, but actually the first one represents the first 15%, and then the rest of them are like 6 or 7% each or something like that. Maths, can't be bothered doing it off the top of my head. But you know, it's, it's basically once you lose the first one, in theory, the rest of them start to fall much quicker, which might scare you, but actually the rate of degradation is probably broadly on par with what it was before. Um, but yeah, as you say, you know, if you'd done some rapid charges before, you would have tricked the BMS. But the fundamental thing with the Nissan Leaf is, yes, you know, those state of health bars, they give it a, a semi-decent indication of the health of the battery. But again, take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, they are indicative. Indicative, you know, they're they're not, um, you know, absolutely scientifically accurate. Um, but you know, when when you're buying a car, obviously look for one that has twelve bars, ideally. What are the best things that that I can do or anyone can do to improve your battery health for both Leafs and any other EVs? For any electric vehicle, absolutely. So the Leaf is a bit of an outlier because it doesn't have an active thermal management system. In other words, it doesn't cool its battery when it gets hot. And that's why we see with the 30 kilowatt hour in the Sand Leaf, that it's repeated, if it's repeatedly rapid charged, the battery on that will do less miles over its lifespan than a 24 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf um, because the 24 has less capacity in the same physical space so it doesn't get quite as hot during rapid charging. Um, but most other cars on the market today, uh, most other electric cars have a liquid-based thermal management system. And that's good at extracting that heat as it's being produced during rapid charging. Or in the case of Tesla, they allow the battery to get hot during rapid charging because it lowers the internal resistance, which means that the battery can take on more power quicker without hitting the maximum voltage. So they've actually gamed it a bit. They've realized, yeah, you, you can allow the battery to be hot during rapid charging as long as you immediately extract that heat afterwards. And that's what Tesla is very good at. So day-to-day um, -day use for, for battery healthcare, I would say, to be honest, if you need to rapid charge fairly regularly, fair enough, um, the difference for a modern EV between um, one that's constantly rapid charged and one that is constantly slow charged on a wall box at home overnight, you know, obviously the, the one that rapid charges will degrade faster, but you're talking a difference that's minimal over hundreds of thousands of miles. It's still advisable to slow charge rather than, than rapid charge because it generally slow charging actually saves you time because you plug in, walk away, come back when you're done working, shopping, sleeping, whatever. Whereas rapid charging is a bit like waiting at a petrol pump with your car, isn't it? So yeah, yeah I would say, you know, err on the side of AC charging, but don't be worried if you do need to rapid charge. Don't be scared to use a rapid charger in that sense. One thing I would also say is for most electric vehicles that use so-called NMC batteries, that's lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide, they don't like being left at 100% for long periods of time. Again, if you need the range and you're going to be driving the car the next day, then yeah, charge it overnight to 100%. But 
that is particularly true of shorter range cars like my 24 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf from back in the day. But for bigger range cars, now that I've got a, a Tesla that does more than enough range for my usual kind of you know, like weekly trip to the shops or whatever, I generally cut off charging at about 80% because that means that the individual voltages of the individual cells hopefully aren't going to be going across the threshold at which point the electrolyte, that liquid within the battery that allows lithium ions to go between the electrodes, starts to degrade against the positive electrode, the cathode. That happens at a very high cathode potential. A high cathode potential happens at a very high cell voltage. Voltage is potential difference. In other words, the difference between the positive and the negative electrode. The positive gets higher during charging, the negative gets lower. So that kind of is a very brief electrochemistry lesson. But yeah, if you want to avoid degradation that's accelerated, then yeah, aim for about 80% cut off for general kind of running about and so on. And then plug in, say, when you're between 50 and 20% state of charge, again, unless you actually need that full range, in which case it's fair game. But this is talking about being a battery health freak here. Actually, uh, people who have a standard range Tesla Model 3 from 2020 onwards or the new MG4 standard range and increase there'll be a number of other EVs that will do this as well. They have lithium iron phosphate batteries, which we're starting to see make a resurgence as a result of the Model 3 and the Model Y. And now MG is getting in on it. As I said, there's more manufacturers that will be bringing LFP cells to market soon. They are a completely different chemistry to NMC. So the cell voltage doesn't go as high because the cathode potential doesn't go as high. And crucially, that cathode potential, even at 100%, does not cross the threshold, at which point that electrolyte starts to degrade. So you can actually charge a, an LFP battery to 100% as much as you like, and it won't have that same form of degradation that you find right. with NMC. So that's, as I said, the exception that proves the rule, and it's the one that's becoming more common or will very shortly become very common in kind of standard range slash more affordable electric vehicles. So, yeah, they can, they can take a bit of abuse as it is. Um, and, and they're a bit cheaper than the, than the other chemistries? They certainly are. Although that said, there's been so much demand for LFP recently that the price of LFP has gone up. So the, the price differential <laughs> might actually not be as much as it previously would have been. But once the markets settle, once the supply chain catches up, there's plenty of raw material. It's just a case of getting it out of the ground or out of brains or whatever and into a car. And you know those supply chains are, are scaling up. But LFP doesn't contain any cobalt. It doesn't contain any nickel. It's iron and phosphorus and oxygen. It's basically rust that makes up the other side of it. You know, um, it's, it's very cheap material. It's also safer. You could properly drill into some of these latest lithium iron phosphate cells with a metal drill bit and the surface would get to about 60 degrees C and it wouldn't vent gas and it wouldn't catch fire. You have to do something very stupid to an LFP cell to get it to catch fire. And they last longer than NMC cells. But that said, the NMC stuff in modern electric vehicles and even ones from the kind of early to mid 2010s will do hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of miles um, you know, before they have a, a significant loss in capacity, with the exception of the, the Nissan and Leaf, which, of course, doesn't have battery cooling and therefore it has its own accelerated degradation as a result. But, you know, you're still getting into six figures for the most rubbish Nissan Leaf batteries from the very, very early ones. Mm. Um, and then, you know, the modern stuff, particularly the 62 kilowatt hour Leaf, should probably do at least 300,000 miles, I would imagine. Um, right. for, for like a typical person's usage pattern before you start to see any discernible, but you know, really noticeable reduction in range that impacts your your day-to-day -day use of it. So there's a lot of stuff there that the naysayers can um, kind of uh, shut up about, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. See, when <laughs> naysayers are um, bleating on, on Twitter about how EVs are bad because they use cobalt, there's actually more cobalt in the smartphone that was used to tweet that than there is in the battery of a standard range Tesla Model 3 or a standard range MG4. It's nothing like the laptop and phone batteries of old. The amount of cobalt content is being absolutely slashed. The lifespan is so much better, even for comparatively rubbish EV batteries. It's, it's so much better than what's in your smartphone or your laptop. And with LFP and other kind of improvements in chemistries and next generation chemistries that are on the horizon coming to market as we speak, um, you know, it, it really is such a long lived asset. Now, there's very, very little that you should have to worry about as a driver. Thank you so much. So it doesn't matter how many times you rapid charge it, even if it goes above 85% again, and it did, because I was I was rapid charging and then I was checking Leaf Spy. And by the way, if you want to get Leaf Spy, have a look at the link, um, I'll put it below, and you want to get an OBD dongle. So the specific one that works on the Leaf, um, I'll link to that as well. And it also works on other cars. So 
I kept doing that, kept checking. If I turn on the car and look at Leaf Spy, we've got 85.16%. So that should mean we've got 12 bars, right? Right? No, it's still 11 bars. Anyway, waste of time. So now it's just fighting a losing battle, really. It's hovering around the 85% mark, but it, it, really, it doesn't make too much difference anyway, you know? I mean, I've just, I'm not going to worry too much about it. 3,000. 556 miles we've done since we got it in 8th of April. And you might be wondering, how much does that cost to charge, Andrew? Well, it's £1.80 to charge the car overnight on our off-peak tariff. That's 7.5 pence per kilowatt hour. So, filling up the battery, only £1.80, which is brilliant. I'm getting about 70 miles to a full charge. So that works out to about 2 pence per mile. So that means we've spent this is a very very rough figure we've spent about 71 pounds and 12 pence for 3556 miles which is proof that this car is extremely cheap to run for any evs are cheap to run aren't they and now a lot of that actually has been free because we have solar panels and we charge off the solar a lot of the time um and also some of that was at the cheaper rate of five pence per kilowatt hour because octopus put the rate up and um, some of that is rapid charges, which is, of course, cost more. So as a very, very rough average, I'm just saying £71. So a minor service. I had to have a minor service. So £159 from Nissan. It's actually a bit more from James, but I got James out from Cleveland EV Mobile because it's more cost-effective for me. I've got work to do, and I would rather him come to, the, to my driveway and do it instead of me going to Nissan, getting a courtesy car, or just waiting for them to do it. Yeah, £159 from Nissan, but it's £162. Um, from him, so just a tiny bit more, and uh, he checks everything over, replaces the pollen filter and things like that. When he came, something I told him wasn't working was the washer pump. So when I um, did the tried to do the windscreen wipers and get the washer going, nothing came out. And I thought it was just well, initially I just thought we needed a screen wash, but of course I filled that up and that wasn't it. And it was so the, the washer pump had died. So I put my drill on it, okay. put some grease down it, spin it with the drill, and yeah. uh, that occasionally gets them working again but uh, yeah not in this case so the washer pump is something that i actually fixed myself it was a part the part was 64 pounds 43 and that would have then cost an extra 81 pounds 60 for nissan to fit it so sod that i can do it myself so this is the old washer pump and that all looks much better and it's got to go there. You, have you got some plastic trim tool like this? You, you literally just pop it in, scoot this round, and then you can see that that's your washer bottle. Okay, yeah. Okay, there's your rear pipe. There's the front pipe. And that's the wiring plug there. Okay. Okay, so this literally goes in there. There's a little rubber, a little hole with a rubber grommet in there. Yeah. And you just push it in. Okay. And that's it, that's where it lives. Both pipes go on, and then this plugs in on the top. I'm not gonna plug it in because it's quite difficult to get off, but um, do you think you can get that back out? Yeah. Okay, fair yeah, enough. Yeah, are you happy, are you gonna be all right to do that? Yeah, yeah. The only tool I can find that might do it is this. That has to go in there, and there's that bit there, which is, I guess, the power, and that tube there as well. You see that black bit just there? This is obviously the old one, and that bit should go in there. Um, and it goes in, I think, that way. So I need to squeeze that into there. And this red one onto there. So that's all fine. And then we've got the power. Now it all starts getting a bit tight in here. I don't know if you can see that, but that's gonna go that way up. Okay, well I've taken that bit off because it's already in there. Hopefully, that 
Should just fit in there. Yeah, there we go, that's in. Great. And that should go in there. So let's test it. Okay, let's see if the screen wash works. Hey, look at that. Fantastic. And can't see any leaks, so I think we're okay. Obviously I'd use a plastic thing if I had it. Because this isn't gonna do the paintwork much good, is it? Okay. Brilliant. Me replacing that has saved £81.60. That's how much it would have cost if Nissan had done it. So uh, I'm very happy about that. Sod's law that the moment James had gone, the headlight had gone. So um, I got a pack of two H4 lights from Amazon. That was £9.81. And um, I was able to sort that myself. And this is how you do that. Down there, hopefully it's going to focus OK. You'll see this black thing here. And that black thing there twists off. And that's all it is. So once the cover is off and you can see that you've got the bulb housing there. Um, I mean, it's impossible for me to see anything, so I'm just kind of fishing around in here. But if I pull, then you'll see that comes off. And that's the bit that connects to, that's the cable that uh, connects to the line and gives it power. And there are some clips on there on either side. So you just got to fish around. Someone's going to watch this, and they're going to say there's a they're going to say there's a much easier way of doing this, Andrew. And there it is. And now I've got to get the new one in. The hardest bit of this whole process is just trying to get it out of the packet. It's got a couple of tabs on it. One of them's off. This is harder than actually getting the light in. Surely it shouldn't be so difficult. Quality content on this channel, eh? I mean, it's just a tab. So all you have to do is open the packet, or break the packet, as I've done, and there's your light. So I'm now going to put that in there. You can see that there's kind of a spring mechanism here. Once I put the light in, I just have to fold that bit up. So you'll find there's really only one way for it to go. That bit there is at the bottom. So that's now in, and I'm going to lift the spring over it at the back, and hopefully that will keep it in place. So the light is in place. It's really difficult to see. And then there's a spring, kind of a spring clip either side. So I'm just going to push one side in. And you probably can't see that, but one side is in and there. And then you've got another one on this side. Just have to put in place there. And now the next thing I've got to do is put this bit on. Okay, good, that's on. Let's turn on the lights and see if they work. That's all I really had to do uh, with the car. I mean, that's pretty simple stuff, really. So bearing in mind it was about 5,250 to buy, it's now worth about 8,500 because the used market is mad. There are loads of scratches all over the car because we don't treat it that well, really. Um, it's a kind of a, a knockabout kind of car. So um, if we got those fixed, then it would be worth about 8,500 probably. So um, again, it's just, uh, I think most EVs probably appreciate, they don't appreciate at the moment anyway. And certainly the case for a car like this, which is relatively cheap and certainly cheap to run. So in terms of the, the Leaf itself, we still love it. It's just as I say we just we use it more than anything else because it's um, a great size we do just do short journeys um, in it I wouldn't I wouldn't go on a long journey with a family in it particularly we've done all of that you know um, in the past when we had one previously I'm not going to do that again so what do we like about it 
pretty much everything. The only thing I don't like is a stereo, which is, um, it sounds like it, it's so tinny on this one. This is the Ascenta trim. You can get the Tecna, which is much better. That's what we used to have. The, um, the sound system is not great. It sounds like you're listening to someone else's headphones. <laughs> the audio quality is not great. Um, so that's a bit annoying. That It beeps like hell. That's annoying. Uh, it doesn't have any um, reversing sensors on this particular model, so that's a bit annoying. But other than that, it's, um, it's all good. It's a complete mess. We don't clean it enough, but um, it's a great, great car. So if you are looking to get an EV, I would say if you've got a drive, if you've got a driveway, and you've got two cars, then making one of them an EV is an absolute no-brainer. I think because you would end up you'll end up using it more than your petrol or diesel car, and it's so cheap to run, and it kind of gets you into the EV game, and it gets you a little bit more comfortable with charging and things like that. So, I would really recommend it um, getting a used Leaf or Zoe or anything else really. Any kind of used electric car is good. Um, but do just check about the battery bars, just be aware of that. If it's lost a bar, that's very common, but it does mean that your battery state of health is at 85% at that point It's lost when it's lost a bar. So get yourself Leaf Spy, get yourself an OBD dongle, and uh, you can check that for yourself. So there we go, that's all there is to it, I think, uh, for now. That's the Leaf update, and um, I think I'll get my wife in to do a Leaf update as well, because she said she wanted to talk about the Leaf, but... Um, um, I haven't bribed her with enough gin and tonic today for her to do this video with me. So, just me. I'm afraid. I'm sorry. I know I'm going to get grumpy comments saying we want to see your wife, we don't want to see you. Well, tough. Thank you very much for watching. Please press the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified of other videos. And I'll be back very soon. Bye for now.